I'm going to make this easy on myself, which is always my first order of business, which is what I'm, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to first ask everybody to briefly introduce themselves from the perspective of this panel, not their whole life. And, um, and then I'm going to go uh, down the panel and ask them to, um, by the way, guys, to, in order to be heard, you need to press a button with that. Okay, got it. Um, I'm going to ask them to talk about, the, and they can choose something that ex, ex, the most excites them or most worries them uh, going forward. So first, let's go, go do the quick introductions, starting Sean. All right. I'm Sean Murphy. I'm uh, a neurologist. Uh, for 30 years. Um, I'm also the chief research information officer of the Mass General Brigham uh, conglomeration and um, a professor of neurology. Hello, um, my name is Maureen Kazitnik. I'm assistant professor of biomedical informatics here at Harvard Medical School. Uh, my group is focusing on developing and training some of very large multimodal pre-trained models that we're using to um, address some of the issues related to data scarcity in medicine and help develop better and safer therapeutics that can benefit broader populations. Hi, everybody. My name's Adam, Adam Rodman. I'm a general internal medicine physician. Um, big, big week. If you go into the hospital, all the newbies started yesterday, so busiest time of the year. And I, I, I study clinical reasoning. Um, and in terms of what I am excited and or scared about, I think- it's Wait, 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 that's not yet, not yet, not yet, not yet. You see, this is- specific this is, directions. This is what, why cocaine has to be a limited resource. <laughs> I am going to have coffee today. <laughs> or maybe more. This is me on no coffee, Zach. Yeah. Please give him some coffee, Raj. Hi, everyone. I'm Raj Munrai. I am an assistant professor of biomedical informatics here at Harvard Medical School. And I'm also a deputy editor of NEGMAI, which is the artificial intelligence focused journal uh, from the publishers of the New England Journal of Medicine and close collaborator of several of these folks here. And uh, and we'll try to try to feed at least a little bit off of Adam's Adam's energy. Absolutely. I think one other thing is Adam said that there's a new residence, but you also have a new uh, whole EHR <laughs> Epic. Reinstall. Yeah. We're on Epic now. And um, I think it was Griffin who was telling me, Griffin has access to the data and said he felt like he was having some errors because he was doing queries and previously he was just getting X million um, patients and then he had that Y million where Y is much larger than X uh, because all the Leahy patients were being poured into that database. So by the way, Adam, I think I'm just jealous of your energy level. I, Maybe I need to get my supplier uh, to get me some better grade stuff. Um, Raj, we'll start with you. What, pick something that either excites you or worries. Okay, so I will be excited. I am very excited. I think this is the most exciting time as a researcher, as an editor, as a you know author, as someone who gets to play with these models. I can't remember a time being in data and informatics uh, where we just had this much opportunity and where the task was really prioritizing what is important, what is scientifically durable, what is clinically meaningful. So, you know, when I was in grad school, I think we were a little bit data limited, uh, postdoc, maybe we were a little bit compute limited, but I really don't think right now we have the same fundamental limitations um, that we had uh, as informaticists even five, 10 years ago. So I, I'm extremely excited. I think one of the things that excites me the most about generative AI, AI and medicine, uh, is I think the relatively recent emergence of real competition at the sort of base, you know, some people call it foundation or frontier, the base layer, I think we're seeing early signs of real, real competition. So OpenAI, GPT-4, that's been the dominant model for the better part of a year. Uh, there's been very interesting studies about what that model can do in terms of diagnostic reasoning abilities, um, even increasingly therapeutic recommendations, uh, really doing doing many, many things and many things quite well. And until I think uh, Google has uh, really uh, presented some interesting um, interesting work and interesting benchmarks with the Gemini model, 
And then even more recently, I think Anthropic and uh, the new version of Claude, which is actually not even the new version of Claude. It's the sort of version, the newest version that they've released. I, I think we're seeing some real, real competition uh, in that base sort of foundation layer. And I think that's good for all of us. I think that's good for science. And I think there's going to be um, very, very interesting research that uh, research and applications that 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 bodes well for in the, in the next couple of months. Adam, what ex excites you or depresses or makes you feel challenged? Well, it's a double sided coin. Yeah. Okay. So uh, in the clinical reasoning space, right, because fundamentally that's how I am involved in all this. We've been talking about artificial intelligence for almost 70 years. And there have been, you know, great experiments in the lab. There have been some really amazing systems out there that have really improved patients' lives, thinking of like AAP help. But really the impact of AICDS has been fairly low. And now I think for the first time since people got really excited about this in, in the 60s, we have an opportunity for reasoning workflows using AICDS that I think will make a real improvement in human performance, which unfortunately has been something that <laughs> has persistently been a challenge ever since we've been studying it. Uh, the flip side of things that I am pessimistic, so I'm very excited about language models and other machine learning technologies in CDS for physicians. I am a little bit worried about the way that I'm seeing some of these things be implemented right now. In particular, I worry about Am I allowed to am I allowed to swear? Oh yes. Yeah. So I'm worried about the enshittification of the medical record, right? If you look at the long history of informatics, uh, it has been characterized by uh, increasing enshittification to the point that I mean, my friend Suba uh, Suba Iran published a paper that in order for me to come onto a service and to read about my patients' notes, I would have to read like Hamlet four times all over, and over sixty percent of that is just copy pasted, and it's not like accurate information. There's a study from my Open Notes colleagues that says one quarter of the information in outpatient charts is inaccurate. So there's a bunch of inaccurate information, a bunch of copy pasted information. No human can understand it. The cognitive load of practicing medicine in the year 2024 is so high. So my worry about a lot of these early implementations that people are understandably excited about is to just insert more uh, like LLM generated text. So one of my examples right now is let's say I take over from one of my colleagues who may not be the best and they've made a horrible medical decision. Let's say somebody has a massive PE and they didn't write an anticoagulant. It's happened, unfortunately. I can tell immediately but let's say they use the new fanciest version of a bridge and a bridge justifies their horrible decision with really flowery text. Well, it is going to be much more difficult for me as a reasonably competent physician to, to understand that. So I worry that we are zooming ahead. Our data systems have made life so miserable for physicians and patients, right? If you've been to the doctor lately, it's like this and the doctor sometimes looks over, but I'm worried that in our, like very genuine attempts to rectify this, we're going to make the situation worse. What excites me most um, recently and what I think a lot about and work uh, quite co co quite heavily on pushing this frontier forward is the idea of building um, multi-disease models. And so let me explain what I mean by that. So traditionally, the approach was to build one specialized, relatively narrow model for a given disease. So the funding was received for one disease, and then we developed a model trained on relatively small amounts of label data for that disease, evaluate, validate it, and potentially um, transition it into implementation. So what excites me most are the opportunities that we now have with large language models, with multi-purpose pre-trained models, to be able to have a single unified model across many, many diseases. And why this is particularly exciting is because it allows us to develop models for some of diseases where currently there are literally no models, no tools, no technologies available. So in my group, we're very excited about therapeutic development, therapeutic recommendations, and, and statistics is for 7,000 rare diseases, only 5% have any FDA-approved drugs. So it's not a question of going from some models to better models. It really becomes a question going from no models, no support, no technologies at all, to models that can achieve reasonably good performance and generate useful hypotheses for disease experts in that area to be able to reason about therapeutic hypothesis or reason about diagnostic hypothesis. So this idea of 
training disease multi disease models has also other important exciting implications. First, multi disease models then are flexible, but it means that we can all of a sudden start comparing disease patients that were diagnosed with seemingly different conditions to each other, typically because we have a unified embedding latent space into which we can project a large number of potentially diverse patients, and then we can start relating them to each other. And this is useful for disease subtyping. This is useful for patients like me functionality, where we can very quickly retrieve patients with similar molecular, genomic, clinical features, looking across different diverse modalities. And it can also enable us in a very efficient manner to transfer knowledge and from diseases that are better characterized, perhaps potentially better understood to diseases that are very poorly characterized and very poorly understood to be able to generate better medical, better scientific hypothesis. So in addition to just creating new research opportunities for medical research, for advances, uh, advancing therapeutic development, the multi-disease prediction models and, and coupled with generative models uh, can also just help with areas where funding is scarce and limited, where resources are limited, because it's hard to expect that for each and every of thousands of diseases, there will be specialized narrow focus models developed. So an enticing alternative to this approach of one disease, one model, is to have a leverage based foundation frontier models that have been discussed today and then specialize them towards new diseases and new disease phenotypes in an efficient manner through in context learning, prompting, fine tuning, and alternative strategies. And, and that can produce more equitable landscape in the sense that many diseases that are currently very poorly served and disease populations can can at least be well somewhat represented in these models or can le start leveraging these models and exploring them and, and see what the challenges are that need to be solved. Sean, I'm going to I'm going to load you up with one more question. So yeah. in go, addition go right to, ahead. Go right ahead I thought I saw your hand go up when you were talking about both GPT or frontier models and uh, local models. Yeah. And since you're in charge of a lot of things going on in MGB, what it, it seemed to be that you said you're doing it. What did it take to get the IRB and the governing people to say yes? I don't know. We work with Microsoft. They did. They, they, Microsoft and your IRB and your and the other governance people said okay. So yeah, we work with Microsoft in order to get kind of this uh, very closed GPT-4 system, which is HIPAA compliant now. Again, lawyers and so forth, I don't know exactly what that means, um, but uh, that enabled us to do some experimentation in uh, working with uh, clinical charts. And, um, you know, that's advanced uh, to the point that, you know, we can kind of see what could be done. Now, having said that, uh, I took Chris's uh, comments to heart in that there's a lot to be done with um, fine-tuned smaller models. Um, and overall, I think um, thinking of things as a very one single big large model is probably not a very good idea. In fact, I feel sorry for the big large language models. The reason though is, you know, how would you like to be trapped in a virtual world where you get nothing except like people typing you questions and then you just have to rely on stuff you already know, right? That's called a professor at Harvard Medical School. I feel sorry for those professors yeah. and I'm one of them. So the bottom line is uh, the, 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 probably the most interesting thing in my opinion that large language models can do and have added is this ability to converse with other large language models. And we call that an agent, right? So we let a large language model that's fine tuned to think about um, what is, you know, the uh, problems of a doctor, right? To converse with another large language model, which is fine tuned to think about what are the problems of a nurse. And so they can go back and forth and then you know, then the doctor has to look up something, right? It's got to look up like, 
oh, uh, what is the latest treatment for diabetes? Because I forget what it is. So enable the large language model to get out there and look it up. It's on the web. Just look it up, right? And then, you know, if you think about most things we do, we don't just like get a big blah and just do it. We kind of like have to think about it. And then we're like, okay, we're going to do, you know, the yard first, then we're going to trim the bushes, then we're going to, and so forth, right? So you have to plan things out. And each part of the plan might need a little bit of a different kind of large language model to actually do it. And so the respiratory therapist large language model can come in when they need to analyze the pulmonary function test results and decide what kind of therapy to put in place. This then is a way that these agents, which are based in large language models, can collaborate with each other, can look up and use tools, they can look up databases, they can find uh, all the medical records that they need on the patient dynamically the latest stuff from the emergency room, not right. Otherwise, they'd be locked in themselves. It'd be it, it. It just it just pains me to think of what it would be to be a large language model in that uh, situation. So you and I are co-found co -found the LLM uh, rights. Uh, you got it. Or liberation organization. All right. So thank you all for indulging me with that. And thanks, Sean, for the extra insight about what, what it takes. I have to tell you that this is uh, a very puzzling area about getting permissions to use it. And I get very different answers, uh, both from the vendors and from various institu institutions about this. The first take was, let's just use local models. And, and, and I totally agree with Chris in terms of like experimenting, right? Because yeah. I know he said, GPT-40 is free, but I don't think it's free. I think GPT-40... Raj, why don't you um, sell for Microsoft? Yes, thank you. Uh, it is free, but it's throttled. And it's throttled to the point that, you know, if you have the, I don't know, it's like a couple dozen messages or two every couple of hours. But it's free. Uh, I free. see. Otherwise, you pay for it? Yeah. Oh, okay. That makes a lot of sense. Okay. But the, the point was, though, yeah. that you can try out all kinds of things, you know, all kinds of workflows and so forth with open source models that are fine-tuned to do certain things. And actually it has been shown in certain situations and I haven't done these evaluations myself. So you always have to kind of think a little bit about like what the real test was and how they kind of, you know, might've stacked the deck. In certain situations, it has been shown that, and I know that has been shown that using a group of fine-tuned uh, smaller models does a better job than if you give GPT-4 a question, right, or 4 -O. So that, um, that's the promise, right, of using some of these uh, open source smaller models. It certainly is a good testing ground, and it uh, gives us the opportunity to keep everything inside the house, right? So you're, you're, you don't have anything going out. Everything's kept inside the house with these open source models. They're running on your own GPUs and you can do and say whatever you want to them and it's not going to be used against you. Good. So now we're going to go back to Raj and the question I'm going to have for you is of all the things that you're doing with AI, not necessarily just generative AI, which is the closest to actually use slash implementation? I think uh, maybe I'll give two answers. So I think the number one use, so I, I run a research lab and you know it's machine learning scientists, clinicians, uh, med students, uh, and we're very focused on near-term clinical decision-making um, and we're a data lab, an informatics lab. And so in practice, we're coding a lot, right? So we're writing computer code and R and Python uh, and analyzing data sets and building machine learning models. And I have to say, I think the number one use of the new large language models, so I will focus on, on LLMs, is as a coding co-pilot or assistant for students in my lab and for me. And that is not theoretical. That's in use right now. We are a one of the leading labs in certain areas, and we are using this every single day to accelerate what we do, to pressure test uh, what we're building. Uh, and really, I think it's unlocking abilities 
for people who are not as strong on the coding side and even people who are very strong uh, that they, they wouldn't otherwise be able to do. Now, my second answer, if we're more focused on AI for diagnosis, I also think it's tempting to think that we're in pilot phase and we're you know, exploring and we're having sessions like this and very carefully moving along. But I think that is, it's total delusion. Patients are using this every day, hundreds, thousands, millions of times. I'm using this in my own care, care for my loved ones. Um, it is a second, third, fourth opinion. It is incredibly patient. It is incredibly helpful as a tool to bounce ideas off of, to explore, to understand things that are jargony, things that are complex, alternatives that maybe I don't have time. You know, I have a, I, I think I'm very embedded within the medical system here and very privileged. And I still feel like I barely have time with my primary care doctor. And I often feel that they, you know, they have an answer and they don't really want to go into this ideal of shared decision making and have a 20, 30 minute discussion with me about what my values are around taking the statin versus not taking a statin. I don't think that is, I think it's, you know, it's, it's ideal. Um, but I, I think what we study in the lab is how well these AI systems reason, how well they do diagnostically, how well they are, you know, in therapeutic decision making. And again, that is, that is already here. People are uploading their data now. Patients are already turning to these systems. Doctors, Adam will give you the doctor perspective. Doctors are using these systems with, um, with complex cases and, and, even, and even in other types. So this is a good sign for you as a human being. Uh, my prompt did not actually result in the uh, output that I had expected. So I want you to add one more, one more, uh, one more uh, piece. Click, which, click regenerate. Click <laughs> regenerate. So one part, we've heard a lot about equity. And there's another part of your AI research yeah. that's around equity. Yeah. I'd like to hear how you think that's going to play out. Explain, yeah. explain what I'm talking about yeah. and, and how you think that's going to play out with AI. Yeah. So a uh, big part of what we do in my group is look at clinical decision making across populations. And so a lot of this is with traditional clinical risk equations, things like the estimated glomerular filtration rate, pulmonary function testing. Uh, we have a new paper coming out soon on ASCVD, so atherosclerosis, cardiovascular disease. And we have these simple risk prediction equations and a really big focus for the past few years in these regression equations or in these reference ranges has been on how we index normal variation across populations. So should we compare what's normal for you to a race group, right? Maybe it's black versus not black, which it's been for EGFR, or there's a few more race groups for pulmonary function testing. But needless to say, this has been very controversial and this has been a very criticized practice in, in medicine for the past few years. So our perspective has been to inject data into this debate and into uh, the clinical practice societies as they're forming guidelines around how to move forward with these traditional risk equations around the implications. And there are many, many implications, sometimes profound, around how normal variation is indexed with regards to race, but with regards to, to other demographic variables as well. And this is a reminder to me. So, so I think Zach is now prompting me into the, the right part of prompt, you know, uh, model output space that, uh, that he's interested in. Um, the, I think when we're thinking about, and there are big concerns around LLMs and other AI tools exacerbating existing bias, you know, propagating it at scales that we don't currently have, I think it's important to remember what the status quo is. And so I think it's important to compare to the existing system, to existing traditional risk equations. And you know, the question we should ask of, of any LLM uh, as we're thinking about or any AI tool is compared to what? And I think if you, if you really sort of start to pull that thread, you'll find that existing medical decision-making, existing ways that we cement how we define normal variation, how we make decisions across populations are often also very, very problematic. Um, and I, I think it's a perspective that's useful, uh, you know, as we as we think about evaluating LLMs and and understanding where where they can go they can go awry. We're only at the very beginning. There was a study by one of my colleagues, Roxana Dineshu, published in uh, NPJ uh, Digital Medicine, I think about a year ago, and I think that is the the tip of the iceberg in terms of evaluating what we can do with LLMs propagating some of the race based uh, clinical decisions. But the point of that paper is that they're propagating existing ways that doctors are making decisions with equations that are used 100, 200, 300 million times a year in the United States. 
Uh, and I, I just think it's a, it's a helpful perspective. These are tools, they can exacerbate bias, but I'm also very optimistic that existing AI tools can be tools to, to reduce bias as well. Wow. Is, that, is that a better, click, better model? Click Regenerate is just such just a great save, save that one and then I'll, I'll reuse that one yeah, in the future. Right. Thank yeah. you, thank you. So, Adam, what's, I think I got a, a pursue. Where do you see this happening the soonest? It, where do I want to see it happen the soonest? No, where, where, is it, where it's actually going to happen. Uh, where it's actually going to happen the soonest is ambient listening. That's already happening. Doctors well, tell, are tell us about what, what, Yeah, so ambient listening. So I, as everyone who has seen a doctor, which we're all, all humans, we're all patients, knows, your doctor mostly does, like when I'm in clinic, this, right? Inputs on the computer while you talk to them. One of the solutions over the last 15 to 20 years has been to have scribes Scribes are usually young people who want to go to medical school who get paid be below a living wage to type down what a doctor says. Um, in fact, if you're at UCSF, you can do a scribe fellowship so you can have the honor to pay your employer to work for them. So one of the answers over the last 10 years has been um, like transcription tools, ambient listening tools. Uh, Dragon is one of the most uh, popular. And in the last one year, there have been a variety, a panoply of tools that use language models to take the information. So rather than just simply transcribing it, but to organize the conversation between a clinician and the patient into a note that is inserted in the medical record. MGB is doing it right now with a bridge, right? Um, there's there's Nuance uh, DAX, there's Nabla, there's a lot of different tools, and we're starting to get some data back. So Kaiser did a, uh, did a trial on these ambient listening tools, and it did, in fact, there was a dose response curve. The more you lose the, use the tools, the less you do pajama time. By the way, pajama time, this is a fun uh, introduction into the medical jargon. Pajama time is the time you spend at home at night working on the computer, finishing out your charts. So the early data does in fact suggest, and these are tools that exist right now, and at least talking to my colleagues, there is a, a thirst and a hunger for these tools. So that's where I think the first place that everyone is going so you get it. You get it. Okay. So you, since you brought it up, where would you like it to be? Yeah. So what I use it for right now, and Raj kind of suggested this. So a few days ago, I had a really complicated patient with like a mysterious presentation of a large vessel vasculitis, but didn't fit my typical buckets. It's rounding with the residents. So before I went into the room, I pulled out GPT-40, used the voice one, gave it a prompt, no PHI, and asked it, what should I be missing? And it actually gave me such brilliant suggestions that it, it changed the way I approached the patient. Like I checked for Paget's disease, did a full oral exam to look for oral ulcers, took a really detailed sexual history. And in fact, now we think the most likely diagnosis is some sort of infectious aortitis. So right now, I think one of the coolest things we could do is some sort of AI second opinion service, obviously something that respects patient privacy and PHI. There's lots of, lots of problems with this with some of the foundation models. There's also many different sorts of prompting strategies that we could use, but something built into the health record. We know, actually, this is really cool because we've been doing this for like 30 years from human second opinions, that even when the human second opinion doesn't change the diagnosis, this is one of Kathira's studies, only about 6% of the time the diagnosis was changed, the patients got better care 30% of the time. So there's something about the process of considering other things that make the doctors take better care of patients, even when it doesn't actually change the final diagnosis. Right. Marinka, are the things that you're doing, where do, which would you think are going to impact first? Um, so of the things that we're doing, um, one thing that we're very excited about is um, drug repurposing and essentially expanding uh, the use of existing uh, FDA-approved drugs for novel um, diseases that have very few treatments or patient populations that currently cannot benefit from, from existing treatments. And so here what we have been developing are then models that can that are really trained at scale. Um, they're trained across 17,000 different disease phenotypes and, and they can produce a highly accurate um, prediction list and identify opportunities for drug repurposing um, or off-label use of existing drugs for patient populations that, that currently don't have treatments. So um, in addition to developing the models, what we're also thinking a lot about is how to make these large AI model, models more 
accessible directly to domain experts in the field, whether those are clinical researchers or drug designers or rare disease experts. And so as part of that, we are developing these human feedback loops and user interfaces that not only show model predictions and nice passages of text that the generative AI models return, but also identify what are pieces of data in existing medical knowledge that the model relies on when making a particular prediction. And so these predictive rationals are useful for a few different reasons. First, showing predictive rationals to human experts allow us to identify whether models have currently been trained well. Are they trained on the data that's really helpful for making a particular prediction, or are there any problems or missing components or missing incomplete regions where more data should be either collected or the model should be cleaned up or the underlying data should be cleaned up? And separate from that, they're also useful, these type of predictive rationals for human experts to kind of sparse, go through many therapeutic hypotheses, and then identify what are those that are more or less trustworthy that would maximize the yield of downstream investigation, uh, either biological experiments or, or, or clinical um, is, ex, ex, uh, evaluations. And so what we recently found which I think is quite interesting, is there's lots of uh, research in the field regarding developing explainability and various interpretations of AI models. And what, in addition to developing that, that type of algorithms, what we found through a human pilot study that we have ran with um, a, a few dozen of, of experts was that it's also important to think about how to present outputs of AI models to domain experts. It's not equally useful to just present it as a plain, kind of long series of paragraphs that the model directly produces as output. It's also not equally useful if you just visualize a hairball of some medical knowledge graph or a medical clinical guideline, but it's really particularly useful to represent the, the, the outputs of generative AI models and the outputs of these more complex models in a way that somehow relates to the cognitive processes that human experts actually go through when making a, a, a decision whether a particular therapeutic hypothesis in our case is worthwhile further investigation. And there are real implications for that in terms of just the amount of time, the amount of resources it takes for human experts and the level of expertise that is needed for an expert to make a decision. And, and so we're very excited about this notion about um, uh, or the interface between on one end developing AI models and then transitioning them into the practice by also thinking about what are most useful effective ways of presenting the outputs of AI models to human experts with diverse type of backgrounds and different levels of expertise. For example, what we found is that a first year PhD student would think about a specific molecular disease phenotype and prompt the large language model completely differently than a senior PhD student or perhaps a postdoc who has went through five, seven years of very focused detailed study about the disease phenotype. So how can we then expand the use of models so that they provide output that is high quality output, even if the user input prompt is not necessarily most detailed, most precise. And so, that's that's something that I'm very excited about in context of therapeutics that we're pushing forward. So before Sean answers, I just want to give you a heads up. After Sean answers, it'll be the a short period for you to answer questions, or ask questions. So think about questions because that time will be limited by the fact that there's food. And so think according of to my calculations. There's not much time, so um, let me just kind of no, summarize into, into a time. few little, little comments. Um, so in a very kind of uh, pedantic way, maybe, uh, I'll recount the story of when I was an intern on my second day <laughs> at the Beth Israel Hospital. And uh, I got this new patient, and it was great. And she was great until the uh, senior resident goes, you're gonna have to do a chart biopsy on this patient. I go, what? All right. He then proceeded to put down six huge charts next to me, of which I needed to now spend the next six hours, it seemed like, looking through them to try to pick out you know, all the details of everything. 
it was very, very challenging. Um, she was a wonderful woman, and I'm glad that I she was my patient, but boy, that chart biopsy was, was no fun. What can really happen, as many of you have already probably tried out, right, in Microsoft Office, even if you click on the Copilot thing, is it can summarize stuff for you. All right, why is that actually useful? Well, in research, a lot of times we need to do chart biopsies because we need to answer certain questions about whether they qualify for a clinical trial using inclusion criteria, you know, do they have heart uh, disease, you know, and so forth, and do they have exclusion criteria, you know, are they pregnant and so forth. Now, the problem is that um, some of those criteria can get quite involved. And so we basically built I2B2 in order to answer some of those very, very important questions so we could gather sets of patients together for clinical trials and offer those trials to them. Now, what can we do with large language models that can summarize? Well, they can also look in the charts. And thanks to a study that actually uh, Kavi Bakolakar here was part of, we've actually validated, right, that we can do a chart biopsy with large language models. We can pick out fairly uh, complex um, clinical trial exclusion and inclusion criteria. And fairly accurately, and better than most humans who would do a chart biopsy, pick out whether they actually do qualify for that clinical trial or not. This is a huge cost savings uh, for um, doing these kinds of feasibility studies. And it's going to open up new realms of, you know, it was just too hard before. And now we're going to be able to not just, you know, take I2B2 and make it into 50 patients and look at them, but we can take all 5,000 perhaps patients who are just, you know, maybe uh, uh, kinds of candidates and look at all of them and include more patients than ever into our clinical trials. Sean, thank you for bringing that back to ITB2. Um, that was great. So time for questions. You have a, this amazing uh, group. Uh, so this is your chance. Yes. Hang on. Microphone heading your way. Wait, wait, wait. Wait for the microphone. Yes, Mark. Hey, this is uh, Abu Mosa from the University of Missouri. Uh, thanks to the panel for this excellent uh, conversation. Question to Sean is, uh, do you wanna, uh, if you could give us a little bit of highlight in terms of how you manage the expenses in your uh, GPT-4 with uh, the example that you gave, uh, that would be helpful. I I'm sorry, the what? Expenses. The expenses. Um. Boy, that is a good question. So uh, in the trial phases, we actually, speaking of deals for Microsoft, had deals for Microsoft that let us actually, you know, do a lot of this stuff. And I'm not going to say it was for free because as an enterprise, we spend hundreds of millions of dollars on Microsoft stuff. So it's not like it's for free in any way, but nonetheless, but, but overall, uh, it was not logged the way it is. Uh, like now, when I go to GPT-4 and I do one of these types of like agentic things and it goes on for maybe 20 minutes and I have a bill of over $5 for just one, you know, going back and forth for GPT-4. So I completely appreciate what it is that you're saying there. I think this is a huge push for why we need to use local, local, uh, small uh, language models. Because if we can take uh, and fine tune local models to basically work together to basically recreate or surpass what GPT-4 can or GPT-5, which is probably going to be much better, but 10 times the price, who knows, right? Um, that is going to be the key to be able, to be able to experiment in this space. Because otherwise, I can understand spending $5 per patient on a you know, summarization that saved me six hours of chart biopsy. I, I get that. But for us to experiment in this world with, you know, using different kinds of approaches to like, you know, training the models and all different things, it's going to be, um, it's going to be expensive. And so I think the cost savings is going to come in using uh, open source models and fine tuning them 
and then getting the 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 prompting right and so forth and that'll that'll save us that's uh, a great answer anybody want to on the panel want to give a count a counter uh nah all right griffin Thank you. Um, in our mass CPR use case, um, we're often for disease outbreaks, there's brand new information that's rapidly changing. Um, can the large language models incorporate this new information and the timeliness of it where even if it's a week or two old, it may not be relevant anymore? And you know, what's the speed of that? So you're joining Zach and my club to free and the large language model. Okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, the answer is um, give a large language model a tool to be able to look stuff up, right? And you can do that all kinds of different ways. Um, you know, the familiar way now is to use uh, retrieval augmented generation or RAG models, which lets it, uh, you know, you put all that stuff into a real-time database and then it can search it using embeddings, which is a great way to do a search. Um, but you know, you could think of all kinds of approaches that um, you know could even potentially leverage uh, some of the parameter space that the large language models have inside them already to access these outside uh, 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 entities. I'll call them. But yeah, tool use I think is the key to your the solution to your your problem. Over there. Uh, I'm Zach. I'm an ETL developer at Children's Hospital in Arkansas. Uh, my question is, um, so you, you know the the pharmaceutical industry is really good at kind of getting in doctors' good graces. They they kind of hack, socially hack the community to try to get their drugs prescribed, to try to get their illnesses diagnosed. Um, obviously, they're going to use chat AI, and they're going to try to train that data to their benefit. So my question is, is there anything you guys see in place that will stop that from filtering into the large language models and sort of like overwhelming them? Okay, I'm going to ask Adam. You're a bit of a historian. How do you, how do you think that might play out? Uh, in terms, uh, so in terms specifically of like branded models that might make certain uh, certain suggestions. I don't know. That's a great question. It's actually a very bleak uh, future that I hadn't thought about. I, I don't have an answer to that. <laughs> oh, it's coming. Trust me. Yeah, I mean, I actually I think if you want to get really bleak, uh, like with the work that Marek is doing, which is really really cool, like eventually we're going to have you know, treatment pathways that are separate from a traditional disease nosology. And then what'll happen is there'll be like a Google nosology and there'll be a Microsoft nosology and maybe there'll be a BI nosology, but it won't be so good. So depending on, you know, how much you're willing to pay, you get a better treatment pathway. But I, I don't have an answer for that, but I'm a very pessimistic person. So Marinka, let, let's, let's stipulate that. <laughs> let's stipulate that, of course, there will be forces that will want to slip in essentially the equivalent of an ad. Is there anything that you're doing or other people doing that you can, might see as an antidote to that? Yeah, so it's it's a, it's a really great question, and also goes to the previous one asked by Griffin with respect to what happens to these models when the new data become available, and and sometimes that data is means that there are very recent development or perhaps an emerging pathogen that. Um, for which data become available after the knowledge cutoff date, which is the date up until when all the data was used to train the models. And so everything happened that happened afterwards, the model might not be aware of, so the model might not know about the latest advancement. And on the negative side, it means that over time, some data become is not relevant anymore or becomes factually incorrect. Imagine like having uh, the model trained on the data up until a specific time. There were certain presidents of certain countries uh, uh, that, that kind of sit in the White House. And then sometime yet, uh, later, that's changed. And so how do you tell the model that that has changed? So, and that's, that's a very important um, area of research known as continual learning, where the question becomes, how can we continually update the models as, as, um, over time as new data become available? And there are two types of editing to the models that you want to make. Sometimes these new data become available, you want to add the data to your model. The way we approach that is through what has been discussed before, additional fine tuning, tool use, augment, retrieval augmentations, et cetera. The other use is model deletion, 
which is we want to delete pieces of information from the model. And the way we generally measure this nowadays is that if you want to delete a piece of information from the model, then the way we quantify it is that the, the deletion has been successful if the model effect, effectively is not biased with respect to that piece of information. And there are some ongoing research that, that shows that that could potentially be done, at least to some extent. Much of it has been motivated by some of the copyright lawsuits that were concerned with this question of fundamentally, I have a data point, perhaps it's an, it's a, it's a poem by by some uh, by, by by someone, or perhaps it's a novel by Shakespeare. How do I know that my large language model was trained on that data point? But you could also imagine asking this question: Here's an ad by a large pharmaceutical company when they want to effectively increase the chances that their drug will be ranked at the top of prediction list. Can I test? whether my training, the training data set of the model was poisoned in some way with that data point. A very important, if I just make one final remark. Please take it. Okay. Spell it. A very point, important point here is to distinguish between what are known as open source models versus open weight models. So this is a, important in the era of foundation models and was not relevant just a few years ago. Open source models, are models where what we have access to is not only the, the, the actual model weight, but we have access to the training data sets and we have access to the code to train the model. So in fact, we were able to train the model from scratch. When that in, in information is available, then we really can understand the model fully. There are very few models of that available. One of them is called Olmo developed by Allen Institute at AI, trained here at Kemner Institute at Harvard recently. Most existing open, what were deemed open source models are really just open weight models like LAMA2 or LAMA3. You can access model weights, but you really don't know what are the exact training data set used to train the model beyond a paragraph of text that, that Facebook a, a research lab put on their GitHub repo. So, that creates lots of interesting questions that require uh, careful thought. Um, just to add to that, I, I think it's worth separating what is a property of the model versus what's a property of the use of the model. And so I think for all the reasons Marinka just said, it's extremely complex to know what's actually embedded within these models. Uh, and there are very complex approaches to trying to remove bits of information or supplement or add to what the model can uh, reason over, uh, you know, to getting to Griffin's question. But there's also very simple things that you can do that completely alter the behavior and the values that are encoded or embedded within the way the model's interacting. And so there's a pithy summary of this, uh, which is I think a tweet by Andre Karpathy, who's a leading figure in AI, just English is the hottest programming language, right? So <laughs> a simpler answer than rag and fine tuning and, you know, doing all these things to embed the latest information about whatever, or your values or your goals, either as pharmaceutical company or as insurer or as a uh, doctor or as patient, is to just give a little bit of context in English and you unlock surprising amounts of behavior and surprising uh, values that are encoded in the, in, the bit, in the performance of that model. And so I don't think we have to do anything too complex actually to either get a model that already is uh, pro sort of boosting that drug uh, for your, your particular pharmaceutical company or, or acts in the, in, the, in the sort of complete opposite um, interest. And so it's context. It's just a little bit of context that you feed to the, the model before you ask it a particular question. So in that note. In that... So on that note of uh, appreciation for uh, raw English, um, let me uh, ask you to acknowledge our wonderful panel.